Let us pray. Come quickly, King of Kings, as the light breaks over the horizon and shine on us. By the light of your word, show us the path we are to walk. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Let us listen to God's word for us today. The word that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. In the New Testament, we read from Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 13, beginning in verse 11. Besides this, you know what time it is. How it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know what time it is. But do we know what time it is? It seems a silly question since all we have to do is look at a watch or a phone. But for all our digital mastery of the time of day, do we really know what time it is? Modern life has lived under the tyranny of time. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, when town clocks standing at the center of a community began calling people to work at their shifts in the factory, life began to be lived by a much stricter time discipline. Sometimes these town clocks were even mounted on church towers so that the church became the proclaimer of the gospel of productivity. Prior to the invention of mechanical clocks, time was told by being in touch with the movement of the sun and the moon and the stars. Life was lived at a slower pace since productivity was generated by the energies of man and beast. Men and beasts need rest and that limits productivity. Then along came machines run by the burning of coal, which produced many good things, but time sped up for the simple fact that coal doesn't need rest. Productivity could now continue around the clock. Today, it is not just the speed of coal-driven productivity, but the speed of communication that has increased the pressures on our time. We are bombarded hourly with news and direct messages, both personal and work-related, many with the expectation of a quick response. So today we live and breathe according to the minutes of our digital time tellers, often completely overwhelmed by all that we have to get done in the minutes of the day. Knowing what time it is at all times is critical if we don't want to fall behind or be left out or let others down or lose our jobs. 
family calendars, work calendars, school calendars, church calendars, sports calendars, extracurricular calendars dominate our days. And yet, beneath the clamor of our modern lives, an almost imperceptible voice asks, do we know what time it is? Today, on the first Sunday of Advent, we come to worship to have our time reoriented. Right here in the midst of our busy lives, on this first Sunday of the Christian year, we get a sense of starting over as we begin to make our way toward the remembrance of that hour when the eternal God entered into time-bound existence in the humble birth of the child of Bethlehem. The Christian life, says Paul to the Romans, is about knowing what time it is. He's not talking about chronological time, about the rising of the sun over the horizon every 24 hours or the circling of the earth around the sun every 365 days. The time of which Paul speaks is about the rising of a new age, the coming of a new order to the world, a new time that pervades all times, a time inaugurated by Jesus Christ in whom God has acted in a decisive game-changing way. You know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. In these days that are dominated by our clocks and our artificial lights, waking from sleep, I would venture to say, is more often than not an unpleasant experience for people. Even for morning people, that initial struggle to move from waking to sleeping can feel unwelcome. Much of the feeling may have to do with what awaits us in the day ahead. How about you and your first moments of awareness in the morning? Are you greeted with thoughts that energize you or that make you want to pull the covers back up over your head and hide? It is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. Not literal sleeping, of course, is not what Paul means. He means our spiritual sleep our lack of consciousness of what God is doing, our lack of awareness of God's presence in the world. He calls us to a spiritual awakening, to live life on God's timetable. He invites us to be fully awake to the presence of Christ in ourselves and in others, to be fully awake to the eternal light that has broken over the horizon of all time. But Paul says in so many words that we've been sleepwalking. He calls us out for the many ways that we live our lives half asleep. He wants us to live honorably as in the day, to put aside the works of darkness, to not be caught up in reveling and drunkenness, debauchery and licentiousness, quarreling and jealousy. The common English Bible, the ones that our compromands use, put this more plainly. Let's behave appropriately as people who live in the day, it says, not partying and getting drunk, not sleeping around and obscene behavior, not fighting and obsession. Pretty plain talk. But Paul says that when we know what time it is, we won't waste our energy on these things that do not matter, these things that only distract us from our reason for being here. Paul is talking, I think, about our addictions by which we dull our spiritual senses and do our best to stay asleep throughout the day. Did you hear your addiction in that list? Are you addicted to alcohol or another drug of your choice? Yes, I have to ask that in a Presbyterian church of fine, upstanding people this morning. The Surgeon General just reported that one in seven Americans suffer from a substance addiction. Hmm. Oh, just the candle lighter, we're okay. The flame is where it needs to be. Just making sure you're awake, right? Yeah, one in seven Americans suffer from a substance addiction. Or is yours a sexual addiction made so easy these days by the internet? Or perhaps a work addiction protects you from dealing with your personal pain? Or are you addicted to drama 
always stirring the pot for yourselves and others, for yourself and others, not able to be happy unless you are unhappy about something. Or perhaps you're an adrenaline addict, seeking the thrill of sports or conflict or road rage or political campaigns, all of which keeps you from having to sit quietly with yourself and your God. Or a trivia addict, constantly surfing the news and celebrity sites, or spending inordinate amounts of time on Facebook, aka crack book as it's called, or Instagram, or whatever social media serves up your constant distraction 24-7. Whether it's a substance or sex or work or drama or adrenaline or trivia to which you're addicted, it's all about hiding from the day, hiding from wakefulness, because waking means there is real work ahead. Wake up, Paul urges. Dress yourself instead with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't plan to indulge your addictions. Paul makes it clear what this means to be dressed in Christ in the verses immediately prior to this talk of waking up. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. To be dressed in Christ is to put on love for each other, for the neighbor, and for ourselves. Love is the armor of light. It is the way to be awake. So this would be the point in the sermon where I should tell you a story about a great armor of light victory. A success story about putting on Christ, putting on love. But the story I keep coming back to this week is more of a dilemma of love. There is a man, I just learned his name this morning, his name is Stephen. A man who is waking up and getting ready for the day very near to here. In fact, right on the other side of this wall, of this tree and these windows, it turns out that the little courtyard in between the outer wall of our sanctuary and our other buildings makes for a cozy, private little spot for a homeless person to sleep. Late last Saturday, a week ago, on the afternoon, I was on my way from one thing to the next, and I stopped in at the church to pick up something I needed for Sunday. I noticed a man with a backpack in the, sitting on the bench in the little park across the way, and I wondered briefly if he might be sleeping on that bench that night. But then, keenly aware of the minutes ticking away on my day, I was off again, and he passed out of my awareness. Then on Tuesday morning, Tony and Howard discovered this man asleep in the little nook of our courtyard. They woke him up and spoke with him and found that he's not from here but passing through and they told him how to get to Triune Mercy Center for a place to sleep and some food to eat. That night after the session meeting, I was leaving the church by myself curious to see if he had returned so I peeked out one of the office windows and sure enough, saw a pair of feet sticking out from the corner. So this presents a dilemma to a man of the cloth who doesn't want to be a hypocrite, right? A question of morality, a question of love. What does one who's wearing the armor of light do for a homeless man sleeping on the church grounds? I consoled myself with the thought that I at least wouldn't call the police on him and have him removed from the property, although there could be some advantages to that since the police would maybe help him get where he needs to go. If I would had ready access to a blanket, which I didn't, I might have opened the door and offered it, but then what if he asked to come inside to sleep? Well, we do have those nice gain rooms. There just aren't any beds in them right now since those move around with the families. I suppose the couches in one of the youth rooms might have been nice, but that surely would have left lingering evidence of a homeless man's presence. And those couches aren't really mine to offer. Then there's the couch in my office, but once inside the church, I'd have to stay with this man due to the number of items that might walk off with him the next morning. Maybe love would have been to take him home to my own house, as the prophet Isaiah says that I should do. But that certainly is not a long-term solution. 
What happens to him the next morning when his situation is precisely the same? Would I drive him back and drop him off on the park bench? And so in the end, I let the man sleep and said a prayer for him, that God would help him find his way where he needed to go, that God would show me what it means to fulfill the law with regard to this man and the many others like him in our city. If love does no harm to a neighbor, I suppose I loved him, but it did not feel like enough to be called love as I drove home to my warm house and soft bed. I checked on Wednesday morning. The man was gone. Tony and Howard had not seen him. Didn't see him again until as if on cue, having written this sermon, he was back this morning. And so afterwards, never is a sermon so readily able to be applied. Several of our members met with him on the park bench and began a conversation with him about his finding the way that he needs to go. So this is not an armor of light victory story, and yet it reveals the struggle to which love calls us. It reveals something about the world that hides in the dark but is visible in the day. If the gospel of Jesus Christ calls me to wake from sleep and to get ready for the day by putting on love, then somehow I have to open my eyes to take this man into account. To live in the day is to be awake to the presence of Christ in this man and in the other people I meet, and to remember that our Lord was born in a cattle trough, in a stable generously offered when his parents had no other place to take him. You know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Lord, wake us up and make us ready to receive you when you come.